Welcome to Show Studio. We are here in London. Uh, it's not too hot today, not as hot as we saw in Milan, uh, which we might get into in a second. We are here to discuss J.W. Anderson's Menswear SS23 collection um, and also Women's Resort 2023. But before we get into what was there, um, the panel will introduce themselves, starting with you, Joshua. Okay, so my name is Joshua James Small. I'm a sustainable women's wear designer and freelance writer. Hi, I'm uh, Osama Aloudi. Um, I'm a jewellery designer and academic, I guess. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Sonny Hall. I'm a poet and an artist. I'm Ben Evans, and I'm a freelance writer, researcher, and lecturer. Uh, I'm Joseph Bates, and I'm an image maker and costume designer. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thank you for tuning in, everybody. Um, this is an esteemed panel in many ways, because I guess with all of Jonathan's collections, there are so many different things we can pull on. Um, and on the Instagram yesterday after the show, you probably would have been able to catch um, a little bit of Hetty's video of Jonathan speaking backstage about the show, um, which is always a very fruitful um, moment for journalists and anybody attending the show. Um, because what tends to happen is, of course, uh, Jonathan has to, in about two minutes, explain what we've just seen. Um, because we all like to be told what we've just seen. Um, and to that point, I guess what I wanted to do first was work out what you all made of what we've just seen. Um, and in no particular order, Hussam, what did you think of the collection? <laughs> um, I mean, it was, it was initially, yeah, like I, I guess uh, Hattie, I, I watched Hattie's um, sort of uh, debrief. Um, it, it felt I mean, she called it unhinged, maybe disjointed was what came to my mind a little bit, but then I guess there was a purpose to that. Um, so I think it was kind of quite apt, maybe in a way, um, this kind of slightly um, eclectic mix of very personal symbols and this kind of surrealist thing, sort of uh, this introspection of Rembrandt, I guess, I guess in this kind of context of like uncertainty and war in the background. You know, this is kind of like a Rembrandt's portrait is kind of also from a period where there was war in Europe for decades. Mm. So I guess we quite often escape yeah. when things are uncertain around. And yeah. I guess that's why I found it apt. Okay. We should say that this um, portrait by Rembrandt, this from 1630, um, it was the invitation to the show um, and also became part of the sort of, I guess, you know, uh, guerrilla marketing campaign within Milan itself, where posters saying, have you seen this man uh, with this picture were posted all around the city. Um, this image was also then kind of used as a print on clothes, on jeans, on sneakers, and in lots of different places, um, which I think I would like us to get into in a second. Um, but that's an interesting point. So this idea that you think that Rembrandt made this portrait of himself in a time when, which was quite unsettled, and perhaps we're back in a sort of unsettled time. Yeah, it was a kind of time of culture war as well, actually. Um, so it's kind of, I mean, I, I do think the, the references were quite intelligently chosen and the kind of slightly floating, non-committal almost kind of mixture of sort of surrealist sim symbolism was kind of, uh, I mean, it kind of made sense for me in a way. Yeah. Um, it felt a bit self-indulgent, but you know, who am I to judge? Maybe, maybe it's the time for that. <laughs> yeah. Why not? Um, Sunny, as an artist, how do you feel about art being used in this way, in almost in a remixing of an artwork for fashion purpose? Well, yeah, at first I, yeah, at the first glance of the collection, I, I felt a slight like, disparity between it all, you know, I think that was my first reaction, and then I, and then I looked into the symbolism and, and, and uh, you know, there's a kind of polar relation throughout, like, which actually allowed for, when I came to understand the symbols, you know, Rembrandt, then the barcodes, you know, this kind of, it's quite conflicting in a way, do you know what I mean? But the, the I think because of that, it's in a way like a um, struggle in modernity, you know, mm -hmm. like how, um, you know, he's referencing this painting, to this artist from so long ago, and then we've got these distressed barcodes on the clothes, you know, I felt um, it was good, you know, that's how I feel in, in some way, you know, this, we need to draw from what was and, and what was the foundation of, uh, you know, uh, certain arts and, and then this, you know, consumerism, um, you know, um, 
Yeah, I feel. I, 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 at first, I, I was, I was quite confused, but I came to uh, admire the, you know, how he, he, he used these symbols to. It was slightly absurd, which I liked. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. Um, and this is kind of absurdist uh, uh, line of, of inquiry is something um, he's been doing for at least the last two years. The pandemic seems to have really shaken Jonathan's design sensibilities. I think he's kind of asking questions that lots of us are about what is the point, what is this, what's going on. And there are, you know, in, in interviews before, he's also said that he's not really that interested in um, people just liking stuff. You know, he kind of wants to spark conversation or debate, a bit like the one we're doing now. So I think what's interesting about this is a lot of it is a bit silly. You know, a lot of it is a bit stupid or self-indulgent or any of these things. But I think, um, as Hassan says, you know, if he can't do that at this stage, then, well, you know, what's, what's the point? You know, he's got this kind of platform. So there's an interesting idea of sort of all of that, you know, dragging in sort of all of the sensibilities of, of what it means to be making images in a, in a time like this um, and throwing it all onto the runway. I guess another thing he also said was that the clothes are kind of pretty, you know, archetypal, they're standard. You know, it's, it's a jean, it's a tank top, it's a jumper. Um, but he's kind of added these symbols onto them to make us perhaps think about them slightly differently. I'm a bit uncomfortable about the portrait being used on, on those jeans in that way, because I just find it a bit, you know, and he has a history of doing lots of collaborations with artists and their estates that make me a bit uncomfortable, because it's a bit, it's a bit like gift shop merch in a, in a museum. And there's something about it that feels a little bit too kind of in that, in the way that brands do a drop of something that sells out. You know, there's something about it that is incredibly, um, I don't know, perhaps disrespectful to the work, even though when he talks about it, of course, we get to understand it a bit more. But there's something about it that makes me feel a bit uneasy, but perhaps what is great about this is that more people have now seen that self-portrait um, that would never have seen it before. So I think there's something interesting in, again, using, this, using fashion as a platform to expose us to works of art that maybe we don't know. What's quite interesting with the, the self-portrait using that, and also this being his own label in parallel to doing work for another big brand is just the idea of, you know, what to what extent is a designer revealing about themselves in their own label collection? Like, you mm. kind of, you read, well, I like to think you can read quite a lot about Mutual Prada or Raph Sim Simmons from their own kind of collections, but I don't really know what I know about him from this. He's quite an enig enigmatic person, especially for someone who speaks a lot and speaks very eloquently about their work. But <laughs> in terms of what this actually reveals about him as a person, I'd be interested to know what he is his take on that would be on a very personal level rather than what he thought people wanted from him, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. Well, Joshua, as a designer, what do you think this may reveal about Jonathan's...? I honestly think it was a quicker body of work. Like, I don't mean that any, in any disrespect, but we spoke about this off camera in that he's got a lot going on at the moment because he just dropped the Montclair, which was like three days ago, I think mm. it was, and obviously he's doing Loewe alongside this. And the reference is um, to a play that he auditioned for way back before he was a designer. So it's a play he already knows. It's like in his back pocket. Um, and outside of that play, it doesn't, there's, there's not any more, there's any, only other than Rembrandt, there's not any other major um, influences. So while it, the collection makes sense and it fits perfectly in between past and I expect future collections, yeah. I don't think it's insane, like in terms of design, because the eclecticism yeah. and the like surrealism lives within the styling. It doesn't live within the pieces. Yeah. Like the pieces all, can be separated, broken down, and sold very easily. There's very little there that won't be able to be reworked. Like the bicycle handles, that's obviously just prop, isn't it? It's mm. not, not all of that sort of stuff isn't um, for sale. So you take all of that out of it, and it is just a very simple collection. All of the pieces make sense, and from a design aspect, like when you take them apart, like the jeans, I think, are really clever, where you've got the um, the cuff, the extra cuff down the bottom, which mm. reminded me of the Charlotte Knowles, you know, the cuff. Uh, I don't know what they're called. They're like arm warmers, but for your legs. Chap? Leg, war leg warmers. Leg warmers. I don't mind like that, but you know what I mean. Um, with the denim yeah. sort of thing, and that's quite clever. And like so, but he's always done that, taken like very simple details of a piece of clothing and moved it to somewhere where you wouldn't expect it to be. So yeah. design-wise, if it it's like it doesn't doesn't surprise me, doesn't shock me. I'm not disappointed by sure. it. But, um, 
that's a very bland, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It just I feel like it could get forgotten. I don't mean that disrespectfully, though, because I'll I, always have an affection. I think one, I think that idea of props is really fascinating because particularly yeah. the day before this, we had you know the Versace show where the models were walking down with sort of pieces of homeware, so the you know the Baroque vases or ashtrays, and holding them, and they had little dinner plates swinging off their belts, and that's that's kind of one way of doing it in a, in a less successful way, perhaps. You know, here it is actually the props are embedded into what yeah. into the message of the collection. We should say that the play you're talking about is the Pitchfork Dynasty, yeah, sorry, which is a 1991 play written by Philip Ridley, who's considered kind of a YBA, so a young British artist. Um, it's a play that, you know, is very difficult in lots of ways because it's um, it sparked a sort of uh, method of playmaking that was very much called in-your-face theatre, in-your-face, actually, not in-your-face. I mean, it's, it's a bit like beat, beat literature also, mm. actually. Um, I, I don't know, I, I want to kind of say, in a way... You know, I, I mentioned that word self-indulgent in a way earlier, but I think this cobbling together your identity out of different bits of your life, I do think that's a kind of generational thing. And I mean, he is talking to this sort of generation of um, Gen Zers who are kind of used to putting together their kind of identity out of sort of you know, some memories, some kind of made-up things. Yeah. Um, so I, I kind of agree, it's kind of, you know, in the Vogue re runway review, it sort of ended on this, it's a moment in time, so maybe it's not groundbreaking in a way. But he talks about his work as kind of curating, doesn't he, more than, perhaps, it doesn't, more than even just design, I think, about bringing together all these different things and just presenting it, rather than necessarily claiming to make any completely, yeah. you know, Original ideas in fashion and costume. Josie, what do you think? I think just like, I mean, going back to what you were saying about using the actual like image, the Rembrandt image on the clothes, it's kind of like using those kinds of references and very literally putting them on something feels a little bit like a, I don't know, it feels a bit of a, more of a blasé way to do it. Mm -hmm. And I kind of got that from a lot of the collection, but I like, I do enjoy like some of the surrealist elements, but like, like some of his work at Lueve with like the 3D printed shoes and the dresses and stuff. It feels like that's a more thought out way of doing it as opposed to like buy candles that are just strapped to someone. Yeah. But I guess they're very particular bike handles, so that's the kind of, the kind of genius. That, yeah, but yeah. that's the kind of thing that's so interesting about it, I guess, mm. is that you can start seeing that he is kind of trying to pinpoint a very particular group of people. And I think it is interesting that, you know, Hussam's mentioning who he's appealing to. And I think too often when we talk about fashion and when we review collections, we just assume that they're all aimed at kind of Gen Z. You know, it's always this young, this obsession with, oh, it must be for TikTokers, when it's not always <laughs> for that because they're not necessarily the ones that are kind of... They, may shape their ideas about themselves and how they want to play with fashion, but ultimately this isn't. This feels like it is for them, so I'm not saying it's not, but fashion in general feels like something that's always critiqued through this lens of, well, it's for really young people. Um, this is drawing, I think, on young people in quite a kind of nice way. Do you think way. he's done that quite cleverly in a way? He's kind of thrown in a bit of a literature reference, he's given us a bit of art history with Rembrandt, so he's kind of covering the sort of like generation that likes to think of themselves as well read. Yeah. But he's also giving um, the TikTokers stuff that they can play with on their, on their feeds. I mean, uh, it is, I, I do think it's quite clever. I do agree it's not groundbreaking in that sense, but, uh, you know, in a way, it's, uh, I mean, I had written earlier, which I'm a bit like, so it sounds a bit too critical, more critical than I mean, but I'd written that it was a bit of a self-obsessed collection for a self-obsessed generation. But I, I actually think maybe that's valid, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I'm actually, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm teaching this generation of Gen Zers, and I kind of, you know, also have to take a step back and then think, you know, maybe, maybe that's valid, um, this kind of shallow, seeming kind of mixing of things. Yeah. Ben, what do you do? You think this? What does this collection tell us about life at the moment? Do you think? Um, if we believe that fashion collections shown at a particular time, even though they're meant to be in some ways poetic, because we're thinking about six months' time, but you know we're kind of indulging in it now. What do you think it might tell us about right now? It feels like a lot of any kind of the more observed of the collections always seem to be kind of a remix of as many different references as possible. Hopefully, some that people won't be aware of already and you, you know kind of little easter eggs for people to spot and say you know I know you know this artist or I know you know all right I'm tuned into kind of skateboard culture or whatever it is so I kind of feel like this is quite representative of those type of collections it's, like you said before the styling is probably a lot of the strength of how marketable and how commercial this whole thing is and he came from a 
did he? I think he used to be kind of a visual merchandiser for Prada, and I've always thought that he kind of the way that he can kind of sell the product is always very intelligent, mm. and that's always been kind of to mix both you know really commercial pieces in a kind of inventive way. Is like he's always pitched that really brilliantly, but that's more about him than it is about kind of fa fashion in general. I'm not yeah. sure if I can kind of identify exactly what this says about fashion now, just from this one collection. I mean, can I maybe ask, just because you're, you could introduce yourself as a sustainable designer, I mean, is, is that a sustainable, actually, sorry, is that a, can we sustain this kind of uh, throwing out stuff there, mixing it up all the time? Sorry, I wouldn't even I dare to talk about, no, I wouldn't, even, <laughs> I wouldn't even dare to talk about sustainability in terms of, because I love J.W. Anderson, but the amount he produces wouldn't, come into sustainability. I mean, I don't want to go too much into that because I'm very much aware that I talk about that all the time. And, uh, but, <laughs> but, As most people who are into sustainability do. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, vegans. But I mean, the one thing that I always say again and again, I've probably said on panels before, is that sustainability is like can only relatively be achieved. Like, uh, and that's being purely honest. You can't be fully sustainable within fashion because you are always producing a product. Mm. So you need to find a balance between what you're producing and do it responsibly yeah. um, uh, and, and being able to do your craft. You can't, to be fully sustainable would, would be to make absolutely nothing at all. Do you know what I mean? It would be to, but then in doing that, you would not be doing, like you wouldn't have a job. So we kind of, it's a, it's a balance, but you need to acknowledge that. You know, the people that walk around that say that, you know, I'm a fully sustainable designer, it's all just, it's all lies. You need to be relative about how you're talking about it and realistic about how you're talking mm. about it. So I would, but I wouldn't put, I'm sure that they have a press release that, um, I, I didn't see one, but I'm sure they have a press release or a statement about sustainability because most large companies are almost required to do that now. Yeah. Um, but I doubt that there's anything groundbreaking in terms of sustainability happening at either J.W. Anderson, Loewe, or, or under the Montclair, just mm -hmm. because there's so much product. I, you could, my only takeaway would be that I hope that people buy these pieces for longevity, that they yes. have a life that li lives on. That's the only way in which these pieces, and obviously these aren't going to be made on enormous scale compared to a, a fast fashion brand. That doesn't make it okay, but it is, uh, it's all about relative. But I, I think, I think the idea, you know, obviously when we talk about sustainability, we are talking about materials, we yeah. are talking about, talk about things that take up space in the world and harm the planet. But Sunny, I wanted to ask you about the sort of sustainability of, of creativity in a way, mm. and the, the artist's brain, and the yeah. creator's brain. How can you, or how should one maybe protect yourself from doing what we're doing to the planet, but to our brains? Oh, so what to put? ourselves first before the planet is that what you're saying well, oh. no 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 no. i mean in terms of to just think of yourself as a as a planet as, a as an planet. ecosystem uh, yeah and the uh. way a designer is kind of um asked to work and the scale of and i would say artists do anyone making anything right now the pace has just been completely ramped up right so if you're an artist yeah. having one show a year isn't enough anymore because you need to entertain us all the rest of the yeah, time constant. through anything yeah. else in other places so yeah. there is this idea that we're sort of running ourselves ragged and i wondered how you Absolutely. felt about that the pace of um, um, oh, your own creative question. I, I feel well. My friend's a designer, and he, I, I see how. But it's similar. With, I think if as I've heard Jonathan speak a few times, I don't, I don't know much about him. But there was a quote actually. He spoke about him being compulsive. You know, his compulsion to work is mm. his only addiction. Yeah. Uh, you know, he doesn't have addictions outside of work, but kind of his work takes that place. And. Uh, I can relate to that, and uh, I, I feel, yeah, if one's an artist, that it's a necessity or an obligation to to do what they do, you know. Um, so, so yeah, no. I, He's definitely a workaholic. I think self-proclaimed, but the amount of <laughs> output that he has, is involved in, I think you can't really. You know, he's kind of quite a special figure in that. Yeah. The man he's has been demanded of him. And when you kind of when you're going back to like the original, you know, the classic ideas of sustainability, regardless of how this, you know, this could be completely sustainable and using materials that he's used before, whatever. Mm -hmm. But the very nature of his business is propped up by his involvement with people like Uniqlo and and Converse and all those kind of people. So when you're kind of zooming out, this isn't me being critical of his, you know, you know, in terms of what how a designer can be completely sustainable is a very yeah, it's a very like amorphous, you know, criticism. I think everyone should be doing kind of things towards it. I think now you can't ignore that that, that you should have an imperative to be a little bit more conscious of your production methods. But the way that he's able to kind of indulge his creativity in collections like this is grounded in the fact that he has a certain amount of commercial foundation from those other kind of times, I, I would imagine. Mm. I also was thinking again about um, 
designers that obviously we now just don't assess their clothes, we assess everything they're doing. And I was looking around my flat and actually most of the, a lot of the things that I have, so the printed ephemera, bits of books, invitations that I seem to have kind of chucked on the shelf and forgotten about, a lot of them are from him or from Loewe. And I, I was quite impressed by my hoarding abilities, but also just the idea that a designer working now actually in terms of what's going to happen in the future and the stuff that I'm living with personally, the stuff I might show students, the stuff that I might, you know, one day want to share with other people on a bigger scale, a lot of them are coming from him. Whereas I think this rush towards, you know, obviously thinking that we shouldn't be creating and printing so much, we shouldn't be making all this ephemera that just hangs around. There's something really fascinating about the amount of things that Jonathan has produced that are physical, that are keepsakes of his period in time. And I think that is, in a time where, you know, people are selling old Phoebe Celine lookbooks, very commercial, boring lookbooks, you know, on eBay for lots of money, um, or carrier bags from different periods when designers were working somewhere, this idea of the material value of the other things. So this idea that if you, if you took one of those posters down that was in Milan, mm -hmm. um, or if you saw a poster shot by Jürgen Teller for Loewe or something, or the Charlie XCX campaign, for the bag, you know, there's something really, if you'd ripped one of those posters off, it kind of meant something. There's this weird kind of crazy fandom about mm. collecting things that I really enjoy about Jonathan, because I feel like he speaks directly to people like myself who love fashion on that level. You know, the, it's the stuff that comes with it, because I'm not gonna buy any of this, I'm not gonna wear any of it, but I will definitely keep the invitation, or I will definitely go and seek out a poster. So I don't have any of you ever ripped a poster off a wall? Yeah. Mm. No, I've definitely kept invitations and things. Yeah. But I guess for every 10 pe people that have kept the invitation, there's 200 people that have thrown it away yeah. too. So it's kind of in terms of, you know, the... What is it from your job working in archives and working, mm. you know, in libraries? Yeah, how do you feel about the idea that there's all this kind I mean, of Yeah, whoever manages there. his kind of 2D archive as their work count. I mean, I think he's done kind of collections over the pandemic that were all to be, you know, completely enjoyed, exactly. you know. Mm. Yeah in kind of paper format as you kind of enjoy the video, which is, I think he must be kind of, I imagine he would have a huge magazine archive himself and obviously his kind of collaborations with Jürgen Teller that we're looking at now kind of really play into that idea of um, like, the, the way that his um, adverts will be seen and either whether on magazines or billboards and the fact that Jürgen kind of um, straddles that line between kind of commerciality and, and, and art, artistry as well is yeah. all kind of wrapped in. He's, it's very clever, the, um, yeah, the curation of what he does. So I think that kind of is quite an apt word for it's, how he operates. Yeah, because again, I don't want to do that kind of thing that people tend to do is that sort of generational panic and going, oh my God, why do you guys are all online so you wouldn't have anything. But there is something about the idea of how do you keep what mementos do you have? Like, what mementos do you have of your time studying at CSM or any of the works you've done? Oh, I, I, I don't know. There's probably just like boxes and boxes of like sketchbooks, notes, just like programs from like shows and stuff. Yeah. Whereas I feel like it's it's almost like merch. Yeah, it is, <laughs> totally. Like, mm -hmm. But it's merch that has a, you know. It's like a sentimental kind of like, I want to hold on to this, even though you're probably never going to look at it again unless you're like clearing out your stuff. Yeah. But like, you like, it feels special enough to hold on to, which I feel like. I mean, a lot of his stuff does that, I feel. Or like just the, like the keepsakes and stuff like that. Or like, I mean, even with him, it's like the Disobedient Bodies book, like everyone yes. who, who I know has that is always like recommending it all the time to like almost be like, I have this, it's an exclusive, I have it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even though it's, you know, not really, but. Well, it kind of is now because it's out of print. So there is that, yeah, the keepsakes, I think, of what our designers or the designers making clothes at the moment, I think is something that is going to become increasingly more and more fascinating to us. As in 10 years' time, we would just potentially just be looking at a lot of digital material. And of course, at Show Studio, there's an archive that's 22 years old, this archive. Um, and so that, what's fascinating when you look back at early films that Nick has done is the kind of graininess of the footage, you know, is the technology itself was old. Um, and so you get a kind of different distance to it, but keeping that stuff alive is also really difficult. There's not that many young brands that do, like, or brands in general that do physical media, though. He's creating like a life, like a, and I almost think that kind of, not fakes, but fakes you into being a more serious brand than you are. And he did that very mm. early on. It's so like very early on, he was creating a product that 
the average person could buy into. Like I could, for a long period of time, I couldn't afford any J.W. Anderson at all, except for the occasional sample sale. Yeah. But I would keep the tickets, I would keep the books. Do you remember the book that he did with all the art in it? It went in Selfridges. They had some signed copies, and I remember I spent a whole day chasing down a copy of that, because it was beautiful. It was to go with the gallery that he did the Hepworth. Mm, mm, like, the Disputed Bodies, yeah. That's yes, what. yeah, yeah. And like, that was 30 quid. Like, that's a really accessible price, really, if you're into, into that. Yeah. Like, that sort of media. And he wasn't, he's only, he'd only been going, like, I think five, six years then, which is still quite early for a brand. And like by having that media outside of the fashion realm, you're no longer just producing, producing clothes, you're creating like a world. Yeah. I mean that people can buy into it and it almost fakes this uh, like legacy. Yes. And it creates like an, uh, the illusion of a legacy brand, which do you then become, which could, because it's only like pre-millennium brands that do all of that, that, that I don't know what to call it, um, like merchandise as well as merch. No, no one really does that. Most people send out invites digitally, whether it's for sustainability or whether it's because they haven't got a budget, so you don't get that ticket. Very rarely, because I do, so like you, I keep tickets from shows and things like that, and over the last five years, they've got lesser and lesser and lesser, mm. and now I find I print them out myself. Because I'm a loser and I want to keep the press release, but yeah. I don't actually have one from them, do you yeah, know yeah. I mean? And also, like, zines and things like that, there aren't many brands. The only one I can pinpoint is Charles Jeffrey's zine that he did, like, two, three years ago. But yeah, again, he's not another example of a really good designer that can create a world out of creating merchandise that fits like perfectly, seamlessly within yeah. the arena of clothes. I mean, one of the things I wrote down earlier when I looked at it this morning uh, was, was also this kind of, uh, yeah, is, is there a kind of longevity in this kind of collectability, I guess? Um, I guess that's the kind of question to ask. But yeah, I, I think in a way the authenticity, whether we can kind of you know, identify with these symbols, whether we can kind of um, find something that resonates, that we can make it our own. I guess that's, or I guess that lends the brand, the authenticity that makes it maybe something that will sort of last yeah. for a long time. And yeah. in a way, I guess he's very good at sort of being in touch with us. Mm. That's something that makes us, oh yeah, the handlebars kind of also remind me of something. And then yeah. that's how you can kind of resonate with a brand. And that's maybe also why you then keep Hold of well, it's like it's like celebrity culture, isn't it? When you go to a gig yeah, or you go there. to a concert, you want the confetti that's got their name on it. You want the ticket. Do you know what I mean? I, I still have. What confetti do you have? Oh my god! Do you remember the bangers tour? <laughs> so, about the Miley tour, I kept the like Miley money, and it's got her face <laughs> printed on it, and it's so, which I thought was like at the time amazing. But now I'm older, and it doesn't really exist because it got thrown away. It's kind of amazing. I think yeah, it's really yeah. cool. Like I think it's like a really cool like cultural piece. Like it probably yeah. doesn't mean anything, but it's just yeah, yeah. like a, and, and obviously as time, it's like magazines as well. Magazines now print not for um, disseminating information. It's more of an archive mm. of information. It's yeah. creating like a, um, a, a curated outlet of what culture is now. It's not necessarily updating people with trends. It's, sure. it's like books, do you know what I mean? People don't buy magazines now because they want to find out stuff about what's happening now. They buy them because they, or most people I know, buy them because they want to keep the editorial in the same way that you would buy a book to keep the story. Do you know what yeah. I mean? You buy into that um, iconography, isn't it? It's just... So it's, how, so how do you feel about your work and how it's disseminated? Like, do you want it to live in the world as a physical thing or are you quite happy with it also uh, existing in a different way? I think physically, like, I could, like talking about collecting, I, I collect books and like first editions that I want... I want to understand the, the initial touch or the initial intention of the artist, you know what I mean? Like, I wouldn't want to go into Waterstones and get um, something that's been regurgitated a yeah. hundred times. So um, I think, yeah, f phys physically is, is how I'd, I'd want it, or just um, something that's alive, you know, be it the expression or the movement. Um, so, you know, um, yeah, that, that's how I want my work to be. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, there you are on the screen. That's intense. Yeah, that threw me off. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can we zoom in on that? Well, your um, work must be in parts, like, kind of replicated and in kind of quotes and things like that. Kind of, you almost don't have control after you've kind of put some work out there about how it will then be yeah. replicated and reinterpreted yeah. kind of by an audience. Is that, uh, yeah. I guess, do you have to just put that out of your mind when you're making the work? Um, yeah, I guess I don't really, yeah, who knows how things are going to take shape. Like, you know, I, I, um, I, just, I just try and trust that it'll be okay. I, or if, you know, because it's one thing making it and then the minute it's alive for the receiver or the reader or whatever, you know, it's then informed differently and it takes a different life. So 
I think that's the most interesting part when, when things um, evolve. Out there. Yeah, when it evolves. Um, well, I guess that, that also touches on how sort of extreme a lot of Jonathan's recent you know, collections have been. There is that idea of it, it being out there so extremely recognisable very quickly also, mm. you know, in that way that you can look at this stuff and, you know, even if you are just used to accessing the shows on, on Vogue Runway or one platform, these will these things will kind of jump at you, out at you. You know, almost they'll become sort of memes in lots of different I mean, ways, he, I'm sure. He, he uses this kind of the power of the second take quite mm. effectively in a way, you know, like these mm. things where you kind of pass them by and then you go like, oh, what was that? I need to look back at that. And I think that's the kind of, mm. this kind of means that he uses. But yeah, I mean, I, I do, maybe, maybe it's my, my genre, but I do struggle a little bit with this, maybe lack of longevity, sorry, almost on reflection now. Maybe as a jeweler, you're kind of always able to bank on the fact that people won't throw it away. I mean, even in terms of fashion, I still have like under from like 99 or something. Yeah. And a pair of Helmut Lang jeans from 96 that I still wear. So I do think it is possible within fashion, but I don't quite know if that's what he's doing here, maybe. You get from a lot of kind of designers about the satisfaction that they have in terms of seeing their work on other people kind of in the street. And I imagine it probably is a lot maybe easier for him than maybe some other designers to kind of identify his work out there, whether that's, yeah, a commercial piece for Uniqlo or one of his own pieces or for, or for Loewe. And I wonder if that's almost a drive. That was the only really not that this, I don't know if this was an outlier this, for anyone else, this piece, but I mean, he's obviously done kind of things that are essentially dresses for was men before. a sponge? Before. Do we know what it was? It's a sponge bob pasta. on the kind of, on the side, it's kind of quite squared off when you, I don't know if we've got a side view of it, but there's kind of, yeah, very much it's like a scourer kind of. Did he do a similar silhouette, like a couple of seasons prior? Like yes. Very, very similar sort of like spongy sort of, I don't know how to describe it. Three. Even in terms of like the length and the kind of general of like flared A-line thing is something he did that I think it's like 2013 or something with those like flared uh, yeah, like see, frilled yeah. menswear ones. It's kind of obviously like a touch point for him, but it's, it's kind of strange that this is the only thing like that in the whole. Do you not feel like the whole collection is a bit like a reintroduction to J.W. Anderson, like through the way he does stuff? Like it, to me, it felt like from a very like pure design face value, it feels very much like a re like a lots of things that he used to do many many years ago in terms of textiles and how he works. It feels playful, but kind of mm -hmm. simple. I don't know, though, it felt very much like, because even the, uh, the place, I know it's not intentional, but the place it's in, it feels very much like the Truman Brewery. Do you know what I mean? It feels very like <laughs> that, that fashion. Yeah. Second took it for Do you know that, what I mean? It feels like that fashionista. Yeah. So if you put that it's, next to a fashionista collection, it would fit in seamlessly. It feels like that sort of like, Fashion is sort of. I love that. It's I like the Churuma Brewery. <laughs> All the way, Milan. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it could be great for Fashion Week. Um, it's, I know, yeah, you mean it's sort of stripped back yeah, in some it's ways? Back. It's stripped back. It kind of. Um, I don't know, it just felt. Uh, let me just have a little look at what I wrote because I was thinking about this a lot earlier. <laughs> It just felt like a reintroduction of like Gen, like Gen Z. Like I'd hate, like like you said, I don't want to go back too much onto Gen Z, but he is doing well on TikTok and things like that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So no, I'm sure there are a lot of people that are like, oh, who is he? What did he do? And this feels like, and he's already got the stuff going with Moncler, like I said, and the web base. So he's got all these extreme outlets that he can push to the limits. Yeah. So why not use his own brand as like this is as like a soft reintroduction to like techniques and things that he would have done years and years ago. Very simple, but makes sense for him. But also he produces so much clothing that his story does feel quite fluid. Like we were talking about, I forgot, didn't say about this earlier, but like, because there is so much stuff, you can really see the continuance. There's never like a pause in between where you're like, oh, okay, what was the inspiration this time? Yeah. You can fully see how he's referenced some things from previous, taking them through. Do you know what I mean? It feels very fluid is yeah. probably the best word to describe it. But yeah, I don't know, like the, like the denim work reminded me of like Christopher Shannon, um, like, 2012, um, and like the barcodes were like a sheesh. Do you know what I mean? The early like 2010s. So you like, mean it felt like London? Yeah, it felt like London. It felt like, but what I mean is the London, like new, like young London, like mm. because a sheesh that was quite early into like his collections mm. and like the Christopher Shannon stuff that's quite early. But it was like it's like the early 2010s, and because of like I said the un unintentional ven venue reference that I get, um, it feels very much like London. That experimental kind of like vibe you get. From Fashion East, yeah. well, that's when which he really makes me think it's like a reintroduction to his techniques. Well, that's when he was really starting to emerge that time, so it would make sense if he was kind of going back to when he started to properly, like, emerge on the scene. But I mean, is, is that is that part of this kind of self-inspection of where where he references his Rembrandt and keeps talking about selfie culture? And it's like yeah, I, I did think there was a lot of sort of uh, yeah, sort of self self. Uh, 
I guess I, I used the word indulgence earlier, but yeah, just looking at yourself in Reflection. a way, it's a kind of, yeah, mm. um, it's an introspection as well. And, but again, I mean, I, I kind of get what you guys are saying, but I do still think in a way it does feel relevant to me. Like, it, mm. and, and isn't that kind of what fashion in a way does? Isn't it kind of always yeah. an expression of what's relevant to us? And yeah. sometimes that's kind of a load of things that are slightly disjointed and disconnected. So in a way, this kind of floating, Sort of, yeah, sort of absurdism, kind of, I don't know, it, it did still, f I mean, may, maybe I almost disgrudgingly kind of liked it. Yeah. <laughs> I think, um, I must say. Joseph, what do you think about this in the context of clothes and fashion in general? What does it say? I don't know, I feel like, I mean, just looking at these images, it's like very, like, this is kind of going to be the thing you remember about the collection, it's going to be like the weirder, like, you know, the handlebars, not so much like the denim and stuff like that. And I think that kind of thing obviously posts online really well. So I think like, it's almost designed in that way, but I, like, I don't think it is, but it just works in that way yeah. where sometimes it does feel really cynical. Yeah. When it's like, oh, it's this like, this one thing that people are gonna, you know, this is like the viral moment. Yeah. Like, I'd, be, I'd be interested to know whether you thought of the Moogler, like, I just thought of Moogler as, as soon as I saw those handlebars on that first look. And obviously that, all of his work has come back into the public consciousness a lot more in the last I kind of year or two. I not Rick Owens, I thought Victor and Rolf. Of, oh, okay. And they did with the rigging and the lights. I really but similar. talked about E.T. with the handlebars, but <laughs> <laughs> Is it BMX, that bike? Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of like BMX skate culture, especially with what um, Kim's doing at Dior and things like that. That's obviously very much part of the black vernacular at the moment. And even the jean shapes. But I do kind of, like, actually, I, I read a little bit this whole, I mean, he, he talks about this kind of YBA author, and I read this whole, you know, Tracy M, and actually I was an art student at that time when they were kind of just starting off with the, you know, like doing this tent where she references everybody that she slept with, mm. which is also kind of sort of selfie, and it was that first generations of artists in a way that, maybe not the first, but uh, one of those early sort of um, iterations of this kind of self-obsessed kind of like documenting yourself and kind of putting it all out there thing. And uh, in, in a way, it was kind of cleverly referenced in that sense, I guess, but a bit mashed up, maybe a bit yeah. superficial at times, but hey. Do you feel like we're at like a critical mass of that to the point where there'll be some kind of rejection of this like... Probably, self? yeah. <laughs> It'd be interesting to know what that, that would look yes. like. What do you think this is a rejection against though in fashion? See, I, I actually think it's a kind of... Uh, <laughs> sorry. Tea. Tea. I have no idea. I mean, I, I don't know, I, I kind of felt it was also a little bit sort of non-committal, almost nihilist in a way, mm. actually. But uh, it's kind of like apathy that runs through, this kind of slight discomfort that also that play is really messed up. I don't know if anybody looked it up, but somebody gets killed with a poisoned finger or something really weird. The play, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It could have been pushed like the whole concept could have, because I literally looked at it and it should have been like the play. There were, I read a couple of reviews from people who wanted to see what it was like if you were in the audience watching this play. And it's meant to be really uncomfortable and you're meant to be really close to the, to the play happening, almost as if the actors could be tripping over your feet. And I was like, wouldn't that be, he's done runways before where they're so, so tiny, you know, and you are almost, the models are tripping over the people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that would have made so much, it would have made more sense here than yeah. ever before to have these really skinny little runways. And the whole thing is meant to make you feel a little bit uncomfortable making sense of this nonsensical sort of nonsense. Um, and I don't feel like it's that, not, it, does, it makes sense. Like the collection makes sense. It doesn't, which doesn't mirror the theme of the play. Do you know what I mean? The play maybe, is meant Maybe to the be heat in Milan nonsense. took care of that for everyone to feel uncomfortable. And, yeah. and Omicron. Uh, everyone's like actually. fanning themselves in the video. Yeah, I think it was really <laughs> the music was good though. The music yeah. was like, a, it was classical, but it had like, if you listen to it really carefully, there's like glitches in it every now and then, yeah. um, which makes so much sense in terms of like trends. Yeah. <laughs> obviously glitches are cool. Um, um, I wanted to talk also about the mini show that happened before the show. So the presentation um, outside by the artist Patrick Carroll. Um, hopefully we've got images of that. Um, what did you all think of that? So guests, as they arrived at the venue, um, found sort of four or five models sat on plinths, on cubes, wearing work by um, yeah, Patrick Carroll, who I think is British, based in the States, um, who makes kind of, it's knitwear meets poetry, meets sort of, um, you know, performance art. So, it's got this kind of really beautiful, if you go on JW's, if you go on JW's yeah, Instagram, Jonathan Anderson's own Instagram, um, you would have seen he's kind of thanked 
Patrick for these pieces. Um, so they're sort of knitted G-strings. There are jumpers and T-shirts, long dresses. I'm interested to see what Sunny will make of this as well. Um, there are passages from the Bible, for example, print, uh, knitted into these pieces, um, which he describes as an art project considering labor, value, fantasy, grief, gender, silhouette, and religious discourses of virtue like everything. and yeah. sin. <laughs> um, so if you go to Jonathan's own profile, we're trying to find it now. Um, but just this idea that none of it really made it into the collection that we saw, which I thought was kind of, mm. um, I think his Instagram is Pat Carr, P-A-T-C-A-R. Sorry, we're just live trying to look for it. Um, but just this idea of almost having a two-pronged attack as well on the show. There's almost like you're presented with this thing as you walk in and then what you're shown on the runway doesn't make sense. I think we, the word curator and curation comes up an awful lot when we talk about um, designers in particular. Um, but there is this kind of sense, I think, that Jonathan is really sort of involved in researching, finding things, looking at things. He's always kind of spotted at Freeze. You know, he's kind of made it his business to be a part of the art world. His work with Loewe is very much centered on that too. His stores feel like art exhibitions in themselves. They feel like galleries. Um, and I like the idea that he's kind of always allowing us into these references, but never in a literal way. So back to your point, Joshua, about the play, yet his kind of version of the play, um, if we go up to the top, and it should be that on the far right, there you go, the G-string. We need to log in. Um, there is this kind of sense <laughs> we'll that. that the references are there for us to know about. So you kind of leave Jonathan's shows or his presentations or videos of him talking with something else to go and look at. Yeah. And I relish that, of course, as part of my job. But generally, I find that lots of designers don't really make me do that. I don't need to. I, they've it's kind of there, isn't it? For you, you know, to the thing, you know, with Kim, I think Kim Jones's uh, way of using references is incredibly literal. So I watch the show, I get the artist, I see the print on seven different things. Done. Boom. It's over. I don't need to go and investigate anymore. But there's something about Jonathan. There are other designers that do this too, and I'd argue that's kind of really good design. When a designer said, "Well, I watched this play, and this is what I did with it." Mm. Um, what do you all think about that idea, Ben? What do you think about? just how he kind of draws references together. Yeah, and how we use references, you know, and kind of what, what they're meant to do in an age where very quickly we can bring up a playbill of that play from 1991. Like, that's incredibly exciting. But I think we kind of often, um, we don't spend enough time realising how lucky we are that we can do that. But what I guess the best example of that, is, I think it was like his first campaign for Loewe was using like old Stephen Mizell images that had no product in it yes, whatsoever. Exactly. It was about kind from of like representing something. Yeah to put a spotlight on something else and maybe just dwell on the brand, Yeah, I guess. I don't know. So I think it's really clever that um, how he does all that. I'd, I'd be really interested to know how he kind of steps in and out of the J.W. Anderson branding brain into the Loewe branding brain. I guess it'd be interesting to have this Budget to, review this, to review this when it comes to seeing the Loewe men's collection as well, I guess, in a, in a week or so. Yeah. So if we go onto Pat's own um, Instagram, so you can see he's been tagged there, Pat Carr. Um, and Patrick put up an... There you go, the first two images there. If you put that... Yeah, exactly. I do wonder whether there is a kind of element of when you're referencing a lot of these things that are also easily looked up, whether you sometimes hide a little bit behind that. Yeah. Whether it's like avoiding kind of putting your own... Yeah. Kind of personal mm. kind of subterfuge. symbolism out there and just drawing on others. I mean, that's kind of maybe as a fellow creative, I'm pondering that a lot. I, mm. I always think references are a way of incorporating someone else's work into your own timeline. Like, if there's something I really like, and I'm like, you don't want to recreate it as an artist because then you're just copying. But if you reference it well enough, See, it doesn't become part of your history. Do you know what I mean? But I was going to think then maybe I, as a creative, I would be more interesting, interested in looking at the method. Mm. Um, and then maybe using the reference or, and or using the reference as a kind of context. So recreating it to get to the point but of... But maybe like I'll do learning. my version yeah. of, like not even my version of the same subject, but my, my kind of reaction or my kind of parallel mm. thing. So maybe that's, a, maybe mm. that's garments and sort of verses kind of making this other... Mm. Yeah, no, I think he... No, but I, I, no, I agree entirely, actually, but I think it's just a different way of work because I think he's got so many references constantly that he probably, and so much to produce, that he probably just 
it's easier for him to reference them in this way, mm. incorporate them in his story, and then be done with it, like a diary. Like, because there are, so, because yeah, it is yeah. so continuous, it's like a diary in that he's referenced it onto the next, onto the next. So you look back and you've got all of his work, and then you've got this, you could probably produce a book out of just his references alone, and that would be, I'm sure, really interesting to, um, to, to me, it also speaks to his generosity because this um, installation here has nothing necessarily lit, you know, to do with his collection, but he's given this space over to somebody that he, whose work he admires and likes, and he's kind of given them this space to do that. I think that, again, so borders no onto this, like, it's curation, you know, it's like, here's a little show of this person that I found on Instagram and I really like their work and you should see it too. There's something really wonderful and not enough people do that. You know, we don't live in generous times, right? People are not <laughs> nice. And just the idea that he's gone, you know, I'll, I'll pay to make some cubes. I mean, I'm going to be cynical on that one. Do you really think it's like generosity or is it just trying to affiliate yourself with things to kind of keep current because that's not fashion art? I, think I, it, don't, I don't think, I know it's a really good point, but I <laughs> would like to think it's generosity. I'm not that cynical as you <laughs> say. <laughs> but I, but, um, and so what, even if it is, right? We, this is a vampiric industry. We all like to feed off of you know, the hot new thing coming up. But I think, you know, Patrick gets more out of this than Jonathan does. Mm. And I think, you know, in this instance, that's kind of a really great exchange. That's and you can see in the comments then. too, like how everybody is, it's just so supportive and it's just so nice to see that. I mean, I guess that's the kind of system that this whole social media thing has kind of made happen. Because actually the 90s fashion was about, a lot about sort of excluding others and being exclusive. Absolutely. And, stuff. and now it's a win-win because, you know, dislike doesn't get you likes, so uh, it's a like-like, basically. Do you think most of those people care about the actual work there? Because it's all like, they're all bland comments. Like, sorry, I was just like, <laughs> rough, roughly, yeah, yeah, yeah. they're all like comments to look like they're affiliated. Sure, sure, sure. They probably haven't watched the video all the way through. They probably don't even know the reference. Not to be like that bitch, but we live in a time where people really don't care about context, and you notice it more and more. The younger, the more you integrate yourself with younger people, I yeah. feel like you realise that there are a lot of people that don't care too much for the, for the context of it. I think there are a lot of people yeah. within that pool sure. that probably do, yeah. but um, they're equal, we're losing context, I feel like. I don't I, know how to yeah, express yeah. that in I a mean, I've, different way. I don't know, is that, is that a like, age-old kind of accusation of a generation? No, I, well, no, I, I, I think there are, I'm aware of like people, young, like younger, I suppose, um, uh, commentators, or fashion commentators, fashion journalists that are really incredible and they really go in depth, far more, far more in depth than a lot of people that are far senior um, than, but there, I think there's the amount of people that don't care for context outweighs now. I think there's more people that, because there's, everything is so direct online. But don't you just think it's like more people have a voice, so we just notice more because previously we were just, but just having because, select I mean, I, I fully agree that everyone should, should have a voice, but there also is, the question of does everyone need to have a voice? Not everyone needs to have a comment on it. You can just enjoy the art for what it is, yeah. rather than everyone having to seem intelligent by commenting on it. Do you know what I mean? I'd rather yeah. I'd rather read something accurate and, and informative and educational yep. than read multiple reviews by people that are just paraphrasing what is already there with less context than was in the original, yeah. which is kind of the problem we're in. Now, because if you look at a lot of those comments, they are just like hearts, and if you click on a lot of those profiles, they'll probably be blank profiles or very minimal. Do you know what I mean? Minimal engagement, they probably don't on that engagement, which is really unfortunate. But when that, but link, that links back to what you were saying about Jonathan being so reference heavy and that you have to look at the collection and then go away yeah. and really read into it. And that's great for people like us that really are engaged and interested in what he's doing. But for a lot of people that are just looking at the clothes, are they then left with half the story because they don't? Care to go and but then remember, some of us are really engaged in what Jonathan's doing because we have to be. Like this is my job, so I have to be, whether I like what he's doing or not. <laughs> but what's what's more empowering is to recognise that there are people that are really into it and they don't have, they don't need to be. Oh no, that's, yeah, that's even better. But the and they, but they could be in the middle of nowhere and they could be, as you say, sort of not know what they're looking at or not yeah. necessarily understand what they're looking at. But I think you, that's dangerous to think in that way because then you become a bit pretentious and you become a little bit snobby. Oh, no, I don't mean it like it that. Cuts no, I know off. what you mean, but. No, I know what you mean, because there are some really amazing Twitter... Um, yeah. Uh, like, is it Kimbo? Kimbo? She, mm -hmm. she is not a... Kimbino. Yes, that's it. Um, brilliant. But, um, and lots of people like her that do make amazing fashion commentary. But my point is when you are flooded with uh, lot, like, I don't know how to explain it. If you look on TikTok especially, there are hundreds of accounts where they're just paraphrasing what is already there with less context. That's yes. What I mean. And that's where I think it's... Uh, counterproductive. I don't sure. mean, I'm not trying to alienate or say no one can do that. Yeah, I think yeah. By all means, give it a go. But 
I think it's important that there's a reason you're doing it, there's a reason you're commentating on it or engaging in it, that you're actively interested in the subject matter, yeah. and they're also educating someone else in that or passing that information on. Yeah, Do you know yeah. what I mean? It's not just a, I'm not trying to say, oh God, no one can get involved. I think everyone should get involved in fashion, but it should be honest engagement. It shouldn't be engagement for the sake of... But I guess, you know, the, yeah. who's to decide what's honest engagement? Yeah, yeah, I guess so, yeah. As a designer, I, I, mean, I used to say this in interviews sometimes, because I, you know, when I started, I made this kind of quite weird things, and quite often the, the journalists would be like, okay, what's this now? <laughs> and I was like, and you know, and then I'm kind of a bit of a sort of nerd almost, like I have lots of sort of like reference layers of yeah. my work, but I always kind of felt, actually, I'm okay with somebody just finding it cute. I'm mm -hmm. good with that. And then if you want to look further, there are more layers to discover. So I don't know, it's, it's kind of a format that you can also yeah. actually use. And actually you might somehow Get those people that you're now yeah. sort of like bunching, you know. Maybe, I'm not, yeah, maybe no, don't, is, don't worry. I mean, it's not slander. Yeah. I don't mean it as slander. It's probably coming across slander, but <laughs> I don't mean it as slanderous. But I think um, I don't know. We're, I think it's a much wider discussion in terms it of is. context and how we review things and how we disseminate information. But that's that, that's that's for yeah. yeah. That, you, two, day. you two need to chat. <laughs> Sunny, what do you make of the work? Uh, a poet, in theory, yeah. way, making work and fashion objects and presenting them in this context. Do, is that exciting to you? Or do yeah, you think no, it's a bit? it definitely <laughs> intrigues me. There's quite a lot of information. Uh, Especially in that presentation, yeah. Um, but I quite like I like the use of symbols, and I think that's what a poem is in some way. You know, like half truths or you know little bits of information that can lead someone in whatever way. Right? It's like a, um, it feels like a bit it, it's slightly impulsive, like the choices. You know, like it's like oh fear, lust. You know, all these kind of human things. I I, I like it. Yeah. Um, I mean, do you, do you give your audience also like enough so they can project their kind of emotions onto your work? I guess that's... Uh, I don't know. I, in some degree, but I, I like this because, you know, you're talking about self-reflection. There's some sort... It seems like slightly confessional in some way. I don't know if this... Was, did Jonathan choose the... The, the wording, or was it the artist? Uh, that's a really good question. Actually, no yeah. idea. The, the press release that came from uh, the PRs talked about the collection that he showed. It didn't really talk about this, oh, which right. again is another interesting oh, yeah, yeah. kind of thing. There's very little information about it. Um, mm. And I, that's what I quite like about it, because it does feel quite, quite simple. And I just like the idea that there are people in positions of power who have platforms finding people on, online that they like and going, let's just do something with you. And Hussam, you're right to kind of question what's the power balance here, but there's always a power imbalance, we should say. And I think in, in some cases, I'd hope that we were a little bit more open to just kind of accept what it is without always kind of thinking that there's something bad happening. Um, there are many more examples we could go into of where that collaboration between artist or young artist and brand is completely, um, you know, uh, vampiric and done in the wrong way. Um, but this to me isn't one. What do you think about it? I mean, I'd love to see if it becomes like an ongoing thing. I think that would be interesting because sometimes, again, like with the vampiricness of it all, yeah. I think like having it be like a one-time thing almost can sometimes feel a bit like hollow. Yeah. Especially, I mean, like, if you're going in to the show and seeing this, it, it places the show in a completely different context to you. So it's kind of like, it is like a big service almost. Especially when we're talking about the show in the way we are, where we're like, what is it? Like, it's about, like, nothing almost. Yeah, like, what is it? <laughs> yeah, what is it? So, and I think that cha th seeing this first changes it, but it's, I w like, I would like to see this, like, incorporated in more, kind of. Yeah. It would have been important to him to have something perhaps a bit more experiential and adding more than just a fashion show because this is kind of his second, second attempt at showing in Milan, like exactly. from the full start from before. So I think it would make sense that he'd want people to kind of dwell and for him to kind of, yeah, have some kind of presence there. And this kind of thing kind of serves that really that people are kind of, you know, staying in the space and kind of getting into that. Oh, yeah, you know, obviously people are rushing from show to show kind of thinking, oh, yeah, like Jonathan is very much involved in the art world has lots of different ideas that I'm you know I'm supposed to be prepping myself into you know reading all of these different cues and codes and notes that he's going to kind of weave into things so it makes sense that it's that he would have been trying to offer something more than just the 12 minute show yeah yeah um just as we're wrapping up I, when Jonathan said fashion is a very modern device but it is not a modern act and I wanted to ask each of you very briefly your thoughts on that quote. Fashion is a very modern device, 
but it is not a modern act. Ben? I don't really agree with that, to be honest. Okay. I don't, well, mainly because I don't think it says that much. I think kind of an act and a device is, for me, it's an interchangeable thing. And yep. having come from like a fashion history background, I think what can be communicated through what we wear is not new in any way. I think the way that it's maybe fashion through commerce is done in a different way, but fashion was a commercial operation throughout history too. So this isn't to criticize him personally, but I kind of feel like it's, I think he's probably saying more than anything else, it is an act and a device rather than really making you think about the, them being opposing. So Sam, what do you is. make of it? I mean, I, I think he's trying to be a sort of modern day Oscar Wilde with a quote, but it didn't quite work. You know, one of those like, oh, women, Someone always, he loves. Be, you know, women always become their mothers. Uh, the problem with women is always they kind of become their mothers. With men is they can't or something. You know, one of those contradictory things. I don't know. I, I think fashion at its very heart is always about reacting to the modern. So maybe it's always a modern device, the modern act, not modern act. I don't know, it didn't quite work for me. I, I tend to agree. Did this feel modern to you? I don't know. I mean, like, maybe not in a great way. Okay. I mean, like, also, I mean, like, what does he mean by, like, an act? Like, an act of what? It would get quite. I mean, that's <laughs> the thing. I guess that's what you mean about the Oscar Wilde reference. It opens up more than it really kind of explains. Yeah. Speaks oh, yeah, he's, he did say that in another quote or about the kind of, um, that he prefers to ask questions. Actually, I used to say that as well. That's quite annoying, really. But but I guess I guess that's the sort of power of the second take, so kind of throwing something at us for us to kind of make sense of also makes us look again, maybe. Yeah. Um, and we'll keep looking again and again to this to try and understand what it is. <laughs> uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us to talk this through. Um, and thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Stay here for more. <laughs>